Good afternoon. Welcome back to another episode of the Lord of the Rings LCG Progression Series. And today we're going to go over the lore and quest guide for Escape from Dol Guldur, the third quest of the core set. And one of the hardest quests in the game. If you're struggling on with this quest, particularly in solo, you are not alone. It remains one of the hardest quests, if not the hardest quest to beat in true solo. So, if you remember the journey so far, we began in the halls of Thranduil, Thranduil, proceeded through Mirkwood, this was passage through Mirkwood, was where we ended the quest at the exit to Mirkwood. Journey along the Anduin, journey down the Anduin began after that, proceeding down on a raft, down to some point around here. It's not specified in the quest where exactly we go ashore. However, the quest Escape from Dol Guldur specifies that we're sent to investigate Dol Guldur by Galadriel, which means that Presumably we went ashore somewhere in the vicinity of Lorien on the west bank and proceeded into Lorien on the errand from Thranduil. The, to help get our bearings, the Shire is located over here. Rohan and Gondor are down here with Minas Tirith there. And Mordor and the Black Gate are there. So we're north of there in Lorien, and the quest says, The Lady Galadriel of Lorien has asked you to investigate the area in the vicinity of Dol Guldur. While doing so, one of your allies was ambushed by orcs and captured, captured and is now held in a dungeon cell. So Dol Guldur is located here in the southern part of the Forest of Mirkwood in The Hobbit, it was specified that the elves don't come down from the northern part of Mirkwood much into Dol Guldur because of the evil that dwells, dwells there in the tower, and we later discover in The Hobbit that the evil that dwells there is Sauron, who was at that point in the story still somewhat weak, not yet occupying Baradur, his fortress in Moria. Or not Moria, Mordor. But he was regaining strength at that point, and this was sufficient to alarm Gandalf and the White Council to the point where they felt they had to deal with him, which was where Gandalf was during the Battle of the Five Armies at the end of The Hobbit. This was brought to life on screen in The Hobbit movies, unfortunately. I don't much care for the Hobbit movies, except for the fan-made Tolkien edit, which removes the parts from the movies that were not in the books, and is quite watchable, I've found, if not good. Because uh, eliminating the parts of the movies that were not in the books solves a lot of the problems of the movies, for me. Though, of course, opinions will vary. But in any case, I loved the book, and in the book it doesn't really go into a lot of detail about Dol Guldur pre preferring to focus on the Battle of Five Armies. And in fact, I suspect in the books that Dol Guldur was included in part as a way to have Gandalf have something else to do. Uh, I don't think Tolkien wanted him to just spend his entire time with the party because he's too OP. He's too powerful. He could solve too many of their problems and it would remove some of the struggle. But anyway, that's just my musings on the on the book and The Hobbit and uh, some of the reasons why Tolkien may have written it the way he did. In any case, Dol Guldur, we were investigating from Loria, which is in close proximity, and our party was captured there. And one of the, well, one of the orc, one of our allies was ambushed and captured there. 
For phase two, finding a hidden entrance to the dungeons of Dol Guldur at last, you attempt to make your way through the caverns beneath the hill, searching for your imprisoned friends. So phase one is all about two of the heroes finding a way into the tower to rescue the third. The denizens of this labyrinth stand in your way while the jailers protect the prisoner. Once you have found your friend and possibly engaged the Nazgul, or possibly it hasn't happened yet, following a thread of sunlight, you discover a cavern opening leading out through the side of the hill. Stationed outside the cavern mouth, the cave mouth, however, is a large group of orcs. So, this entire quest takes place in Dol Guldur and around Dol Guldur as we try to escape after being captured. The quest introduces a new mechanic, new at this point in the game, which is a guarded objective. For any player that's new, any time you see one of these cards, an objective which is guarded, it may come out of the encounter deck or it may start in staging as it does in this quest. Any time you see one that says guarded, it means you need to reveal a card from the encounter deck and attach it to the location. And that encounter card will serve, or not attach it to the location, attach it to the objective. And that encounter card will serve as a guard for that objective. So if you reveal a location, then you must explore the location in order to free the objective. Once you free the objective, it will go back to staging, and then you can follow the instructions in order to claim it, but you have to free it first. If you attach a location, if you reveal and attach a location, then you have to explore the location. If you attach an enemy, then you have to kill the enemy. If you attach a treachery, then you just have to resolve the treachery and then the objective will be free for you to claim. So that's how a guarded objective will work. Now, this quest is very, very challenging. And the first challenge that you face is that you have to, that you start with three objectives in the staging area, which means you start with three encounter cards and that can be quite formidable if you get the wrong cards. In fact, it's so formidable that I would guess that 90, 90 something percent of the attempts that fail this quest in True Solo will fail at setup. Basically, you deal the cards and you've dealt yourself more than you can handle, considering you only start with two heroes. 90, more than 90 percent probably 95 to 99 percent of the setups that you'll get uh, you'll be incapable of dealing with in true solo so if you want to beat this quest in true solo my advice is simply to concede immediately on setup if you don't get the setup you're looking for and continue doing that until you do get the setup you're looking for it's not very thematic to do that, and it doesn't feel good to do that. It feels a little like cheating to just concede it set up over and over and over until you get the setup you want. But if you want to beat this quest in true solo, that's what you have to do in my estimation. For context, in the videos that I did where I played this quest, it took anywhere from 70, I've done two videos so far, and it took anywhere from 70 to 200 attempts at setup to find a setup that I considered worth playing where I had a reasonable chance of defeating the quest. And even when I found a perfect setup, you can still expect to fail most of the time, only succeeding one out of every four to ten attempts if you play perfectly and play the optimal deck and get the setup that you like. So if you're not going to do that, if you say, no, I don't want a conceited setup and I'm going to play every attempt until I get it, well, if you spend 15 minutes on every attempt, what's 15 minutes times 200? 50 hours of gameplay you're talking about to defeat this quest? Well, maybe there's some of you out there that want to spend 50 hours on one quest, but I didn't. So I concede at setup until I find the setup that I want. And it doesn't feel great doing that, but the quest wasn't really designed for solo play, so I'm fine with it. 
And if you're wondering, well, what setup am I actually looking for? My rule of thumb is that I keep conceding until I'm only facing one encounter card. What does that mean? Well, for this setup, I'd be facing two encounter cards because I'm facing a spider and I'm facing a location. But this treachery would not do anything because it deals one damage to each exhausted character. And as it comes out in setup, I'm not going to have any exhausted characters. So it would leave two encounter cards for me to deal with and one uh, objective unguarded. And I consider two encounter cards to deal with to be too much, so I would simply concede this. If you're playing online, you can use Control shift q to shuffle it back into the deck. I know there's a command in Dragon cards that does the same way. So if I'm trying to get a setup for this quest, I'll simply go like this. I can read the cards very quickly now because I pretty much know what all these do. So I know that two of these are going to do something. Caught in a web prevents you from refreshing a hero unless you pay two resources and then you have an enemy. And then this is a dud because it gives plus one threat to things until the end of the phase, which doesn't matter. So you just keep discarding and keep doing setups until you find one you like. I'll find one now so everyone can see what that might look like. None of these are good. They give at least two encounter cards, sometimes three for me to deal with. I don't consider Iron Shackles to be a particularly bad card. I'll consider that a blank most of the time. And you can have to sit here just doing this for quite a while. Sometimes. And if you're doing this live, it can take a good hour to set this quest up of just shuffling and then looking at the cards and then saying nope and then reshuffling over and over and over until you get a setup you like. So this is a setup I like. This card is a dud until the end of the phase raise threat in the staging area by one. That's no problem. It doesn't do anything. We have a location, Great Forest Web, on the middle encounter card, and an Iron Shackles on the deck, which just means you don't draw a card the first round. That's not really a problem. So this is a setup I'd be fine with. Once you find a setup that you're fine with, then you have to select one of your heroes randomly to be the prisoner. And with the deck that I play, it's only designed really for Theodred to be the prisoner, and if one of the other heroes is chosen, then I'll concede and start the whole process over again. So it takes a while to set this up, but it's a lot faster if you're playing online in a program. And uh, live, I would say it takes a good hour to get a setup that you like. Then you, once you have the setup that you like, you're on to phase one. And phase one, you have to you have one of your heroes as a prisoner, and you can only play one ally per round. Now you can't advance to the next stage of the quest until you have at least one objective. You want to, your priorities in round one are to deal with the encounter cards of course. Priority number two is to get set up so that you can engage the Nazgul because and kill the Nazgul preferably on the first turn that you go into phase two because when you go into phase two the Nazgul is going to be added to staging and you don't have to engage him right away. He says, so in, in later quests, the if a card's going to be added to staging, it will typically say it on the quest. This is a case where a card is out of play, but it says on the card itself when it will enter play. It's a minor thing, but typically in later quests, you'll see it listed on the, on the quest card, not on the actual card. But when the prisoner is rescued, you move the Nazgul of Dol Guldur into the staging. So, sorry, it doesn't engage right away when you proceed into phase two. You do have one more round. You'll proceed into phase two. You'll make one progress at least on phase two. You'll rescue your third prisoner, your third hero, and then the Nazgul will immediately engage. And if you're over 40 threat, it's going to engage you right away. If you're not, it's just going to contribute five threat against you. But it will make it much harder to get set up in phase two. It's easier to get set up in phase one than phase two, assuming you can stabilize the board, which is a difficult thing to do. But I don't usually like to blitz into phase two. I take my time in phase one and I get set up, assuming I can stabilize the board. And usually what's required to stabilize the board is that you need the encounter deck to deal you locations and you need a northern tracker, at least one, possibly two. 
because it will allow you to deal with the locations efficiently. If you can stabilize the board and get cards necessary to deal with the Nazgul on the turn that it enters play, or in two turns, more likely, and that typically means that you need Gandalf. So if you draw Gandalf in phase one, uh, don't play him, except out of absolute necessity, because you're going to need him to deal with the Nazgul usually. So phase one you get set up when you have determined that you are capable of taking on the Nazgul or dealing with the Nazgul. You advance to phase two. What, how you, the way that the method that you usually will want to do, the the way that you want to do this, is get your nine or ten progress placed on the quest. But don't claim an objective yet. Claim the objective on the planning phase of the turn when you want to advance to phase two. So let's say you've placed twelve progress on this quest already but you don't claim the objective yet. There's no reason that you need to. Typically, uh, the Jailer can cause a problem, but usually if the Jailer shuffles an objective into the deck, I'm just going to concede anyway. But you just wait. Then in the planning phase, when you've considered yourself, you got yourself set up, you've got Gandalf in your hand, you claim Gandalf's map. Typically in my deck, I put that on AON. It's always Gandalf's map. It's, it's the mildest of the objectives. Each of the objectives has a negative effect on you when you claim it at the end of the round. Uh, except Gandalf's map's negative effect is just that the attached hero cannot attack or defend. And that's not so bad when you put it on your questing hero. Typically, for me, that's Eowyn. I just put it on Eowyn, and she doesn't attack or defend anyway, so it doesn't really impact anything. So you claim Gandalf's map, which means you're immediately going to advance to phase two. With quests, if you're new to the game, you advance to the next stage immediately when the conditions are fulfilled. You don't wait until the end of the round or even the end of the phase. So the second you claim Gandalf's map, if you've already got the progress on the quest, then you advance to the next stage. And when you advance to the next stage, then in the same round, you can quest, put your one progress here, and rescue, or however many progress it is, your third hero will be flipped face up, he's rescued, the Nazgul will interplay. And then if you've played Gandalf already, uh, ideally you'd like to have sneak attack Gandalf, because then once it enters play you can sneak attack Gandalf and deal some damage to him during the combat phase, and then have the Nazgul engage. Well, first you'll engage, and then you'll, have, you'll sneak attack Gandalf have Gandalf deal some damage, and then Gandalf can tank the attack. You've got to get lucky, and then you only have to deal 8 damage to him, 5 more than his shields to finish him off. You've got to get lucky because he has an ability after a shadow effect is dealt to him, and it resolves. The engaged player must choose and discard one character he controls. What that means is if he gets a blank shadow card, no problem. Nothing happens. If he gets a shadow card that does something, you discard a character. So, Hasty Stroke can be good. I don't think I did run Hasty Stroke in my deck. I just hope for the best. But it can be good for preventing that. Otherwise, you're just hoping for the best. And often, if he does actually discard a character, then you're going to lose. But not always. Sometimes you can handle it. Sometimes you'll have a chump that can deal with it. But anyway, you're either tanking him with a chump blocker or with Gandalf, and then hopefully you have the 8 damage. If you have Aragorn and Theodrid at that point, so when you rescue Theodrid, uh, he, and he's not exhausted. He can be used to damage immediately. So if I was playing Aragorn and Theodrid, I'd have 5 attack at least, and I'd only need 3 more from my allies to finish off the Nazgul if I used Gandalf on the same turn. If I didn't have Gandalf, if I didn't have Sneak Attack, I would still plan on just doing 8 damage, get 5 damage tokens on him, and then play Gandalf at the beginning of next round to finish off the Nazgul. If you don't have a play of Gandalf, I've found it's pretty difficult to deal with the Nazgul. It's possible, but it's pretty difficult. But assuming everything's gone well, you've rescued the prisoner on the same turn you've engaged the Nazgul and done your 5 damage to him or 9 if you have a sneak attack handoff 
and you've killed the Nazgul and then all you have to do is get your 15 progress on the quest deal with whatever enemies are continuing to come out but if you get to this point in the quest where you've got your heroes you've dealt with the Nazgul and you're not in immediate danger of dying uh, you're very likely to win that's the hardest part of this quest is getting set up in phase one is very very difficult and then after that finding the right combination of cards to deal with Gandalf no not to deal with Gandalf to deal with the Nazgul so the only continuing challenge is to deal with the aftermath of the Nazgul in the event that it killed something it can be difficult to continue dealing with the encounter cards that come out and it's possible at this point in the game that the threat is getting quite high but should you defeat the Nazgul the only remaining trick to this quest is don't claim the objectives right away just leave them there make your progress until you're up to 15 or 17 or 18 or whatever because you don't advance to the next stage until you've rescued the prisoner and have all three escape from Dol Guldur objective cards and you don't want to claim them until the turn that you're ready to win because they do terrible things to you at the end of the round and you can avoid procking those terrible things at all if you wait so at the end of the round each hero the attached hero suffers one damage and you may not have one damage to give at this point in the game and it raises threat by two and you may not have two threat to give I've played this quest where I won at like 48 threat or something so here's what you do. Once you've got your progress ready and you've got a board state capable of placing seven progress on the quest in one turn, you wait until the planning phase or the resource phase or whatever. Then you claim both objectives, paying the four threat. And then you enter the questing phase and you quest and place your seven progress. Once you claim the objectives, you're immediately going to advance from phase two into phase three. When you advance into phase three, at the beginning of each quest phase, you're going to place the top card of your deck face down in front of you, which is going to be engaged with you. That's not going to matter because your plan is to be ready to place seven progress on the quest all in one turn. So you claim the objectives in the planning or resource phase. You immediately advance to phase three. Then you enter the questing phase you put one card from your deck face down in front of you which doesn't matter then you quest and deal seven progress and you're done under no circumstances do you want to advance to phase three with the Nazgul still alive because the Nazgul is necessary to win you cannot defeat the stage while Nazgul of Dol Guldur is in play and in order to advance to phase three you have to put these objectives on your heroes and they'll do terrible things at the end of each round one damage or two threat and you're not going to last that long with those effects three turns maximum right i mean in theory five turns if you've got it on aragorn and he's got no damage tokens on him but that's not likely so you're likely to have only one maybe two maybe three turns in phase three and you don't want to be dealing with the effects of these objectives and the orc guards that come out and be trying to kill the Nazgul at this point. You absolutely, positively must defeat the Nazgul in phase two before advancing and you have extreme control over when you advance to phase three. You never advance to phase three on accident. In some later quests, you need to quest very precisely so you don't accidentally advance to another phase before you're ready but in this quest you can control it because you simply don't claim the objectives until you're ready to advance and then when you're ready to advance when the Nazgul is already dead and you can place seven progress in one round then you advance and you clear the third stage in one round so that you don't have to deal with the negative effects of shadow key or dungeon torch and you also don't have to deal with any orc cards basically you kill the Nazgul in phase two and then just sprint past the guards that are pictured there and out of the dungeons. So that's the strategy for this quest and like I said the main difficulty of this and the place where you're probably struggling if you haven't beat this quest yet or if you've tried it a lot and you can't beat it it's probably because you're playing games 
in which you had no hope. And if you waited and just conceded until you get a setup that it gives you a chance, you would still find it difficult. It's going to take anywhere from four to ten attempts if you play perfectly and play a strong deck. But you at least have a chance. If you play a lot of attempts where you really have no chance at the start because of the setup, uh, I mean, it's more thematic to do it that way, but man, it's going to take a long, long, long time to beat this quest. And uh, not being inclined to spend 50 hours on one quest myself, I choose to concede at setup until I get a setup that I like, and then I can beat the quest in usually 1 in 4 to 1 in 10 attempts. And once again, the setup that I like is just one encounter card to deal with. So, hopefully that is useful. If you're having trouble with this quest, I would not blame you at all, because it's very, very, very difficult. And I think every player who's ever played this game or this quest in solo, true solo play has struggled quite a bit with it, including me. But it is winnable, and I emphasize that because I've seen players many times on the forums thinking it is not winnable in true solo play, and that is just not true. You just have to be willing to concede over and over and over until you get the setup you like. But I enjoy the challenge of this quest. I think it's poorly balanced. It definitely could have been uh, balanced for solo play, and the, and the campaign mode is much easier because you can actually choose which hero is going to be captured if you play the campaign well, campaign mode well from the revised core set. And that's very helpful, so the win rate is much, much, much better in campaign mode than it is in true solo non-campaign mode. I like a challenging quest, but I this quest needed to be balanced better, but I don't know if they really thought that players were going to be playing a lot in solo, or maybe they wanted it to be really hard solo. Maybe they wanted the, the challenge to last for a while. I don't know. Once you get the setup that you like, I would consider the challenge of this quest roughly equivalent to Mount Doom. Uh, maybe a little easier than Battle for Karn Doom. Once you get the setup. If you, if you count the setup, I would consider this the hardest quest in the game in true solo. If you tried to play every single attempt and didn't concede it set up. So anyway, hopefully that's helpful or at least entertaining. Thanks for watching.